Hello, so today I'm going to be doing a video on perhaps the chunkiest of all of the CDV sort of radiation instruments. And this is the 717. And basically, if you want a really easy explanation of what this is, this is the CDV 715, the high range gamma survey meter, um, the actual most mass produced of all of the CDV instruments, um, but with an extension lead. That's basically all it is. So the reason that has a chunky case, and we'll get into this in a minute, is the bottom section has the ionization chamber in it and an extension lead that you have the option of either using or not using. And the top unit is the circuit board, the battery, the calibration controls, and all of those. And basically how it works is the ionization chamber connects directly into this unit itself. However, if you want to, you can attach the extension lead to the port at the bottom of the case, and you can extend the other extend of the extension lead, you know, to the um, ionization chamber. The simple idea being, that way you can actually be inside a fallout shelter and take a reading from outdoors without having to go out, you know, outside and risk irradiating yourself. So, you know, that's always a good idea. So, what I'll be doing is, when I get a chance to safely use this with the X-ray machine, I will also, on the, at the same time, do a video on the Soviet DP-3B, because both of them have pretty much the exact same operating ranges, 100 milli Ronken to 500 Ronken per hour sort of measurement ranges, so we can see sort of how the units differ and, you know, are similar in that regard. So, this is actually a really nice put-together unit. I bought this on eBay, and um, I had to bid up to um, about £80 for this one, because um, obviously a few other people are interested in it as well. And thankfully this one is fully working, so I'll go through all the functions of it in a minute. But if you're interested, this one is OCD item number CDV717, model number one, series number 97813. Um, so obviously quite a few of these were made. The CDV715, the standard one, was actually the most mass-produced one though. So if we do a circuit check, you should see that that works absolutely fine. And the needle should then, you know, stop somewhere in the red zone like it's meant to. There we go. So like with all of these, you leave them on on the zero mode for a moment, so they warm up. And then you obviously set the zero to zero, using the control knob that's there. Pretty straightforward. And then when that's set to zero, Obviously, you then put it on the lowest operating range. Um, now, like with the CDV715, the lowest operating range is times 0.1. So that's 100 milli Ronken to 500 milli Ronken. You're not meant to take a reading in that sort of initial little area, because you always get a bit of needle fluctuation. Um, so I'm going to, although I can't demonstrate the safely of x-rays in this video, I am going to test if this actually runs um, with a strong beta check source directly applied to the ionization chamber. So, there's the manual for it there. Won't bother going through this manual. The only interesting bit in here is it talking about the spring layout on it. Um, and... I'm not sure exactly why that bit is in there, but... Because it says delete contact spring, change part number of contact spring from 1239 to 81777. So I don't know if that was a maintenance thing or whatever, but... I guess they maybe upgraded these part way through their life, but anyway, that's not important because it all works and I've got it. So, let me now show you how this works internally. So if I turn it off again, um, this is where it's quite interesting. So on this one, we've got two sets of catches. So let's undo the bottom set of catches first. The only thing I've added to this is silica gel, and I've also played with the calibration a bit to get it to, you know, sit a bit more straightforward, if that makes sense. So there we go. This is the bottom section. So... The bottom of this is pretty interesting. Um, all you've got here is a rubber O-ring going around the bottom, and there is your port that connects the ionization chamber to the instrument's mechanics inside. So basically, all this is like this is a CDV715 without the ionization chamber attached. So this basically does nothing on its own like this. But then what you have, you have the ionization chamber there, and you've got your cable spool here. So if I get this out, it's a bit of a tight fit in there, but they both bits fit in. So you can see on this one that this is actually from March the 4th, 1964. So obviously lots of these are mass produced after the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm not sure how long this reel is, it's probably 10 to 15 metres I'd imagine. But you've got a male and a female end. The female end is the one that um, plugs into the bottom of there. The male end um, plugs into there, or oh, sorry, the female end plugs into there. I think they're technically kind of like both male ends, but you know, one of them has a longer pin on than the other. So how you do this is basically, we'll give the reel a little bit of an unravel. 
we don't want to unravel it too much because as I said I want to keep this kind of in its original working condition and there's an elastic band around here so let's just take that off I guess that's been put on there to you know and that's actually broken anyway keep the reel in a bit more yeah it was a broken elastic band anyway so let's unravel this if it will let me it might not because it's in quite tight there right so here goes so this end is the screw end so this connects to the ionization chamber there there's actually a little bit for screwing. Actually, no. This will be the end that connects there. Yeah, my bad. So this is the end you connect there with the little screw bit on it. When I can get it to do it. This is always awkward when you're trying to lean over where there's a camera there. So the idea is that, you know, you just... Screw, there we go. Screw that on there. And now you've got your ionisation chamber connected to it there. So the idea is that you could have this, say, outside your fallout shelter like that. And the wire would go down into your thing. When I say the thing, I mean this. So let me show you the inside of this unit. As always, the bottom section of the case doesn't really have anything in it. And there we go, there is your circuit board. The main thing in this has a better battery compartment than all the other CDVs. See, it's actually got a proper battery sort of thing, rather than it just being a thing where the battery loosely sits in, you have to jam paper in it. So yeah, there's the electronic standard calibration controls on there. So this is just literally a CDV715 without the ionisation chamber on it, that bit, and a better battery compartment. And but what you will notice on the bottom of this case, there is the sort of connector, and that goes through there, you know, so the ionisation chamber can connect on the extension lead. So what we'll do now, let me seal that bit back up. Now I think I have, it's that way around, isn't it, where that sits, like that. There we go, and that sits into its socket. So let's put that back closed like that. There we go. And now, what we can do is get this cable here and poke it, there we go, onto the actual unit itself there. So now, we'll stand the unit up like that, if it will stand up properly, which is probably easier said than done. Maybe if we do it this way around. Who knows, because, ah, there we go, that worked like that. So let's put that there. We'll go back to zero. The zero might change a bit now because obviously we're using it on a longer lead as opposed to having it plugged directly into the unit. So yeah, it looks like the zero needs to go up a bit. So I assume that's just applying more voltage to compensate for the fact it has a lead on it now. And now let's go to 0 0.1. And just to test this is working, you can probably fiddle with the wire a bit and notice it shoot up and down if you... um. Yeah, see, if, if you pull that in and out, you can see the um, reading change. So, yeah, that's it tight in there. Good, and it's gone back to zero. So, now what I want to do is not the safest experiment to do, but I'm going to do it very briefly. I am going to put a DP2 control source, which is a strong beta emitter, no gamma, but there'll be a bit of breaking radiation coming from how intense it is, onto the ionization chamber. And because we're on the milli Ronken range, we might even notice a reading. So, let's have a look. So I've got this sealed in its two glass jars to minimise the reading coming off of it. There we go. I don't want to hold this in my hand very long. Let's pop that there. Now, are we going to get a reading or not? We may or may not, because obviously this is a beta emitter and this only is designed to pick up gamma, but obviously you do get some breaking radiation from a strong beta emitter such as this one when it's point blank next to an ionisation chamber. Let me just move it around a bit on there. Take it off. I don't think that's actually going to read anything on there. Nope. So by the look of it, um, despite how strong the DP2's control source is, that's not actually going to register anything on there. I mean, like I said, it's not meant to be beta sensitive, it's just simply the fact that the DP2 control source is, um, you know, fairly strong. Let's just go back to the zero just to check. So the zero is on where it's meant to be. Yeah, I would assume that the DP2 source just simply cannot penetrate far enough into this ionisation chamber to give a reading. I'll just try it on the bottom side of the iron chamber. But yeah, it's not picking anything up. So, what I'll end up doing then is I will do a video when I next test this with the DP3. 
and we'll test it with x-ray as well, we'll hopefully get quite a good reading on it because obviously x-rays are going to penetrate the ionization chamber far more easily than the beta source. Now by the look of it, you can, if you look at this, detach the um, iron chamber. I'll just put this back in its container so it's safe. You can actually um, detach the ionization chamber if you really wanted to from the unit itself, or like the box, because it's got some pillars in there with screws and I think that basically just means, you know, so the metal ionization chamber directly connects there. What's different about these, you'll notice there's some foil here. On the 715, I think it has the primary contact there and sort of the negative contact there on the ionization chamber. How they've done it on these is both the contacts are essentially, um, you know, connected through the top section. Like that, you know, of a coaxial style cable. Whereas, um, you know, that's different to the standard thing. But as I said, ionization chambers are very, very simple ways of detecting radiation. And they are actually much better than Geiger counters. I will do a direct video where I compare and contrast Geiger's to ionization chambers when you're measuring high levels of radiation. The reason being, ionization chambers actually detect the amount of ionization of the air um, compared to, you know, a Geiger Muller tube that basically registers counts and overloads quite easily. If you're interested in what the inside of an ionization chamber generally looks like, something a bit like that. There's the Polish D08, which I can also test with the X-ray machine at some point. That's its ionization chamber open to the air. But essentially, you just have um, a gap between the positive and the negative sort of current. And then, as the air gets ionized inside, it helps form basically, um, you know, a circuit. There's, there's very good science videos on YouTube if you want to hear the proper explanation of ionization chambers. But just to test this again, just because, you know, I was hoping I would get a DP2 reading on there. Yeah, nothing. So, obviously with this, the DP2 source, as strong as it is, doesn't really seem to do much to um, this particular unit. You know, maybe there's a tiny bit of needle movement there, but not very much at all. You know, so there we go. But that's how the CDV717 works. And as I said, the other way you can operate it if you want to, we'll just flick it off first, is to remove the cable from there. Remove the cable from there. I'll just wrap this back up tight. It's a really interesting smell, these old like 60s electronics. I quite like it, but I imagine a lot of people would hate it. So let's just tighten this up on the spool as much as we can. I said I've not got the elastic bands on there anymore, so they can go. I suppose the biggest gap would be between them and the iron chamber there for sitting flush. There we go. So I'll have that in there like that, assuming that doesn't block the way. Or am I going to need to twist it around slightly more like... Probably like that, I imagine. Get that bit back under there. Right, there we go. So that's there like that. And obviously how we connect it now, this bit will plug just directly into there when it goes flush. So put the silica gel back in. Get that there. Right. What should happen if I get it put down ever so carefully? There we go. It, you'll feel the actual... Um, bits, you know, slide, slide into each other. Just need to get that clasp out of the way. There we go. There we go. And now I can re-zero it. And yeah, as we said before, that it might need to be re-zeroed now because the connection's going to be a bit different. There we are. Turn that back on and it's now running in the actual handheld survey mode. But it's pretty heavy as the survey mode, as you can imagine, because it's got a lot more case to it than the regular models do. If you're just interested in the trivia of it, you can see that the bottom section of the case has the shape of the CDV720, where it has like, you know, the ratcheting beta plate style design, you have the circular bottom bit there. Oh yeah, and I don't know if I've shown this on video, but the DP2 source does register on the CDV720 because it's got the thinner section of the ionization chamber that's sensitive to beta radiation. So in theory, if you did have this same ionization chamber and you had a much thinner section of metal on it, this uh, DP2 source does register on this. 
it just doesn't with this one because obviously the metal's thick enough and the braking radiation is too weak. I don't actually know if they might the DP the DP 720 actually has two batteries compared to one, so I don't know if it runs the iron chamber at a higher voltage, therefore making it more sensitive to a wider range of energies. You know, that might be something as well. Because um, quite often things that are only designed to pick up sort of gamma rays will operate sort of in the um, kV to MeV, you know, kilo electron volts to mega electron volts range of something like maybe 60 kV to... Um, you know, somewhere quite high in the MEV range, where some of the beta sources, if they can penetrate, are actually much higher in terms of me um, mega electron volts than gamma rays. It's just they don't penetrate very far. But anyway, there you go. Um, so that is the CDV717. I will do another video where we'll actually get the needle to move on this by exposing it to X-rays. But hopefully you found this interesting. This is a really cool, nice device, because, you know, if you had this in your fallout shelter, you didn't actually have to go outside to... Um, take a reading but it still operates in that mode which surprised me because I thought it wouldn't work until you know you had the extension lead on it but they've designed this pretty well so yep there you go CDV717 basically a 715 with an extension lead to be used in the fallout shelter so it could either be used by hand or safely you know taking a reading where you'd look at this in your fallout shelter or your basement or whatever and you'd have the other bit on the roof or the you know outside in your garden or whatever in this you know, outside your basement door, what the fallout would be like in the main section of your house. Um, but yeah, with the um, CDV series, the 720 is kind of a superior unit because of the fact it could read beta radiation as well. But they didn't make as many of them, I guess, just the cost of making them. But the advantage the 715 series had over them was it had the 0 0.1 sensitivity as opposed to just the times one. Um, but there you go, but it's a good unit overall, obviously the counterpart for this is the CDV700 Geiger counter for picking up very low levels of radiation, these are to sort of tell you how uh, how long until you die or become seriously ill from being in you know very high fields of radiation, because obviously something that maxes out at 500 Rontgen basically means one hour of, ex one hour of exposure and you're dead. But there you go, CDV717, um, a nice sort of thing, and I'll be doing a video soon where I actually get some... Um, hit by x-rays and we get to see a needle move on it.